set. Hut, hut. As the hills of West Virginia resound with the sound of Golden Blue football. Almost heaven, West Virginia. Now let's bring on the Mountaineers. Goes around about the 15 to 10 to 5. A touchdown with Virginia. He did it. He did it. Patrick White. Touchdown, Tay Vaughn Austin. But Don Nealon's Mountaineers enjoy walking in where angels fear to tread. I think you think that these guys are going to fall over dead for, for you. Well, I got news for you. They're going to punch you right in the mouth. It's Mountaineer pride. Nothing cheap, nothing dirty, but West Virginia football. Right? West Virginia football. We've no doubt tonight they shouldn't have played the old Golden Blue. Not this night. They've done it. They've done it. A perfect season. And the Mountaineers, for the first time in history, undefeated and untied. Don Nealon. And his Mountaineers, for the second time, have finished a regular season with an unblemished mark. Ain't no stopping the Golden Blue. And now recorded from the CRW Studios in Almost Heaven, West Virginia. It's the Country Roads webcast with your host, Jordan Cruz. What's going on, Mountaineer Nation? Welcome into episode 202 of the CRW podcast here. A lot of show to talk about in this one. West Virginia falls to Iowa State 28 to 16, falls to 3 and 3 overall on the season, 2 and 1 in Big 12 play. Golden opportunity in front of them and they couldn't make it happen. And then there's been a slew of things that have happened since then, some things the coach have said in, in press conference following that game and the press conference here for the week of Kansas State. And then, of course, we're going to get into our main topic being the Kansas State preview with our keys to victory and our score predictions there. Uh, but this is our first time really getting a chance to talk to each other since that you know, Iowa State game. Took us some time there to you know let schedules line up. And also I think we wanted to let our feelings marinate because there were a lot of feelings coming out of that game. So – Brad, now a couple days removed. How are you feeling, West Virginia? Fall into Iowa State, another ranked loss there uh, for this West Virginia football program, unfortunately. Couldn't get it done at home under the lights in the coal rush. But how are you feeling now a couple days removed? I don't know. I'm trying to put it behind me. I'm trying to give myself some perspective here. Um, there's a lot of season left to play. Uh, yeah. I'm sure we're going to get into Neil Brown's comments. Um, I, I guess my, my opening thought on that is just like, you know, I kind of get what he's saying. You know, if he comes out and he wins this Saturday against a ranked team, then you guys had fun and you won a game and you ain't got much to say now. So, you know, I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt that, you know, um, <laughs> that, that 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 was what he was meaning. But uh, yeah. to, to the game, though, yeah, frustrating loss, super defeating. You get another one at home. You get all the anticipation up in the world. We give you, like you said, another golden opportunity to come out and, do something and I, I think the word that just encompassed it all was disappointing. Oh yeah. This is disappointing. It, it was a disappointment. It, it was disappointing all the way around and for so many reasons. You come out week before last at Oklahoma State looking great. Um played probably one of the best games of football that we've seen No Brown play so far. Which does even worse get you excited um just to come out and somehow pull a one eighty. Look the exact opposite, and you know, um, I was had a great time doing the live stream. Live stream was a hoot. We had a good interaction in there, um, but really the whole stream for me was the snapping. That's the one thing that just I kept coming back to that made no sense to me. And you know, there's a lot of other things that you know people talk about penalties and you know turnovers, possessions, and you know the picks were horrible. But I blame most of it. I blame all of our offensive woes on the snaps. I don't know how you can play with any kind of confidence, any kind of security without knowing that the ball is going to hit you in the hands. There's there's no way you're able to run your offense if you're out of time and you, you, you're you shaken from the beginning. There's just no chance. And you saw Garrett Green get frustrated. And, I mean, when your leader gets frustrated and you see, you see Drew Donaldson get frustrated, that some of your leaders getting frustrated, it spread throughout the whole team. And there was just no chance that you were going to have – a, success, a successful functioning offense. And I said, you know, 
why are you not making a change? You you have to make a change. But Neil Brown did what Neil Brown has done. I'll say that thing. He 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 is who he is. He 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 didn't change him out. And if you've watched Neil Brown the last six years, you knew he wasn't going to. But to me, that that's the first time in a minute that I've looked at him and said, "Man, I really don't know what you're doing here. You you are costing yourself the game." Some somehow we got lucky and one never got too far away that we pay for it the way we could have. But to take that chance on a game that you know is so big when it's so close just absolutely um, bottled me. Yeah. Blew my mind. And, and to that, I was like, I don't know how you can ever do this. But Yeah, I agree 100%. Especially, you know, that goes into what I want to talk about in a second, which is uh, the press conferences, both, you know, kind of because his thoughts on that and how he talked about the snapping issue. I want to talk about that. And then, of course, the – comments heard around you know mountaineer nation that have really caused an uproar that you mm-hmm. uh, talked about it briefly there we'll talk about those momentarily as well but just in regards to the iowa state game man i think it's i think it's crazy there was a huge turning point right there um, you know what puts that great first drive together they get to stop they put another drive together looks like they're about to go up you have the what looked like a catch but by rodney gallagher until when they mm-hmm. showed the replay i could tell all oh, they're probably going to rule this incomplete because yeah. i saw on the video awesome. board and uh, then Michael Hayes misses a chip shot field goal, which I thought he made from in the stadium. It looked like he made it. Uh, but then once people realized that he missed it, because at first people in my section were clapping, uh, you could literally feel like all the energy come out of that stadium. And I'll say it was a good, uh, great energy that night, a great atmosphere in the lead up to the game. It had a great energy as if like I felt like, oh, man, we're really – this is going to be the night. We're really going to do something. And this has a better energy, kind of like what we were talking about the last time we were kind of on that stage in the Penn State game, the energy we were hoping for. And, you know, that game was more packed, but I like I think this game had better energy and atmosphere to it. Being a night obviously plays a part in that. But uh, literally you could feel us uh, like the momentum be sucked out of the atmosphere of the uh, stadium once that happened. The field goal was missed, and then we're like, oh, crap, we're not going up 14-0. Because one thing you know about Iowa State is they do a great second-half adjustment. So if you can get up in the first half and then maybe build a lead, you're in a good position. But after that, and then you know, three plays later, you have the defensive uh, breakdown the miscommunication that leads to the long Iowa State touchdown. And then it was 7-7, and then the energy in the stadium never felt the same again. It was like at that point uh, we all kind of felt like we were beaten already at that point because that's just something you can't have happen. You know, game six of the season, you can't have coverage breakdowns because of miscommunications, guys not getting the correct calls on defense. You can't Mm -hmm. have that. So really to me, that's where the game changed. And I felt like momentum leave the stadium. What looked like it could have been a turning point night for the program, something we've been – you know, clamoring for we didn't get. And I want to get to the comments afterwards by Neil Brown in regards to the snapping because that was a huge issue on the offensive side. But in regards to Neil Brown, here's just some things I jotted down following that game, some interesting things of note here. Uh, WVU is now one of only four teams that have not been ranked in the last six years in the AP poll, the others being Vandy, Rutgers, and Texas Tech. Obviously, that being the Neil Brown tenure there the last six years. Neil Brown now 3-16 and 16 versus ranked teams. Uh, West Virginia hasn't beaten a ranked team since 2021 uh, and uh, eight straight losses now against ranked teams after this loss to Iowa State here. 28-16, to 16, uh, West Virginia falls um, to Iowa State to fall to 3-3. Three and three. And uh, bad news is another ranked team on the schedule. If you want to be a silver lining type of person, put the golden blue glasses on, maybe you're, you could say you're due after hearing those numbers. But, you know, not good numbers there for this coaching staff, something that people are definitely holding against them coming out of this loss. But one thing that led to this loss, which you mentioned, was the snapping. You know, Brandon Yates, I think, has done, you know, a good job at center. I think this offensive line overall had been good throughout this 2024 season. But obviously he had the snapping issue, which, you know, I thought was a problem throughout the game, but didn't realize it was because he was injured till after the game. So now I want to focus on these Neil Brown press conferences. First, let's talk about the post-game press conference. I'm not going to go back. Oh, over with the, the whole entire injury time. thing, I think that makes it worse. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's, that's how it's not, where I'm heading to. Because at that point, you even know it's something that can't be fixed. Like you're trying to fix an injury on the fly. You, you, it's not even that he's – because if, it, if it's just his jitters, if it's just game day – because I kept saying in the, in the live stream, I was like, you know, this is the first time that Brandon Yates has had somebody squared up on his nose all day. Yeah, with the three-man I said, you know, I said, you know, that's – he's just getting to him. Uh, I said, you know, and that's what it is. And they come out and say, oh, no, it's an injury. And I'm like, then why the hell did you put him there? Like, if you know that an injury is costing you, like if he's just one of your best blockers, 
move him to a guard spot. Like, yes. do something else. Like, do anything else other than – because it just killed your whole offensive drive. And you know, when Neil Brock came in the post-conference and he said, you know, I guess that's up for discussion, I'm like, you just – I I don't know. But, yeah, yeah. We, we can get in. I uh, say so real quick about the Iowa State game too. I feel like we, we had a chance to be in it. We just like kept shooting ourselves in the foot. Offense sputtering, going backwards, you know what I mean? It's just – all around was just like not, not what you want to see. Yeah. It was – and. You know, I, I'm not going to pull up the stats for that game and go back and look at them, but one thing I will say from taking a peek at them immediately after the game is Jaheim White and C.J. Donaldson need more touches in this offense. You know, we shouldn't be 50-50 run pass. You know, I know that we had to throw a little bit later in the game and that skewed the numbers mm-hmm. a little bit, but they should be getting 40-plus yeah. carries between, you know, the yeah. two of them and, and you know. And uh, something else you Jared said, D. too, uh, when was the last time – it made me think about how many times can you remember a Neil Brown senior so far that you've had – a 14 point swing cost you so much. Yeah. And, and it just feels like it happens all the time. And, you know, it's like what you're talking about with the field goal kick. I guess this one's a 10 point swing, really, if you think about it. But it just feels like that's always how it goes. It's always just like a huge mistake and immediately another mistake to let the other team catch up. It, it feels like it's been a continuous thing. Yeah. It's an issue. And I think, you know, talking about that post game press conference with the Brandon Yates snapping issue with the hand injury, as you said, if it is a hand injury, you know, maybe it didn't look bad in practice. Maybe he snapped good all week in practice, but you get into the game versus that three-man front that you're talking about with a guy right over top of you, and you do see these having the snapping issues. Why not, as you said, Brandon Yates has played all five positions on the line, move him over, you know, to guard, and he can still make the calls if that's what you're worried about because he's the guy that makes the calls for the defense. Still have him do that as the guard, just have someone else snap the ball, bring in Lane and Livingston. You've seen he's done a great job. And I think our offensive line as a whole has been great, but that right guard position may have been uh, one mm-hmm. of our weaker positions throughout the season anyways at times. So if you move Brandon Yates there to right guard and bring in Lane and Livingston and he can do a better job snapping the football, I don't think that would hurt you uh, that badly. And I think yeah. for me – I said I would take blown assignments over uh, not getting the football to the quarterback at some point yeah. in time. I said, and you know, I blowing up complete plays there. and you're behind the chains to start the drive multiple mm-hmm. times. Um, you know, that's one reason CJ didn't get going because it happened to him two or three times. Yeah, you can run away from the center of the field, you know, but – you can plan for somebody coming up your middle, but you can't plan for the ball just randomly not making it to the quarterback. Well, what bothers me about the post-game press conference and the reasoning behind it goes to kind of what you said earlier a little bit about, you know, this is who Neil Brown has shown that he is, and he went as far as to say that, you know, in the post-game press conference saying, I didn't want to pull Brandon Yates. He's earned the right to be the team's starting center, you know, and at that point this you don't want to hurt a guy's confidence. And uh, to me, it's like, okay, I understand, yes, he's earned the right. He is the team's starting center. You want him to play in this game. But if you see – that it's, you know, harming your team and could be a something that leads to, you know, a lesser chance of you winning the game. But you're telling me that you're prioritizing a guy's feeling, a guy's confidence over potentially losing a football game. That didn't sit right with me already. So, you know, those post-game press conference points there really already kind of rubbed me the wrong way before we got to the Kansas State press conference and the comments that we're going to talk about momentarily that have really been talked about a lot throughout Mountain Air Nation. But that right there in the post game, the way that he explained the snapping issue, really kind of I was like, you really are like going to prefer to coddle a guy versus winning a football game? Is mm-hmm. that, all, you know, that's the way it came off to me anyways. Yeah, and again, you're not even coddling him. You're He's an injured player. You're – yeah, like you said, you're not even thinking about the team. Yeah, we can yeah. we can fully get into the press conference. Now. Yeah, so we can. let's uh let's do that. Let's um let's get into the the comments heard around Mountaineer Nation from Neil Brown in his press conference leading up to Kansas State, and then we will uh, do a recap of the Big Twelve scores from this previous week there in Week Seven before we shift over and talk about the Kansas State. Give you guys the Kansas State preview in the back half of the show, but in his press conference this week. Neil Brown was asked about the fan base and if he had a message to the fan base from Mike Oste over at WVSportsNow.com. And that's where we're going to share the clip of this press conference from is our friends over at WVSportsNow.com, which will have uh, this podcast up in its entirety on their website as well. And we appreciate them for doing that. But uh, this is the clip from the press conference that has really caused an uproar throughout Mountaineer Nation. And of course, we're going to talk about it, but we got to listen to it here first. From WVSN, our own Mike Asty asked Neil Brown at today's press conference if he had any words for fans who show up for big games despite the team's struggles after the loss to Iowa State, of course. And um, this is what um, Neil Brown had to say. 
this is improv, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Do you have any message to the fans? It's going to be done the night game. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you're going to want the stadium packed. Mm -hmm. Just missed opportunities with, with yeah. the games, kind of the vibe of the fans right now. Yeah, yeah. I, you would know the vibe more than I would just because I'm not on social media. Um, they, they, I get that they want to win. But I would, what I would say is, did they have a good time? You know what I mean? Like, um, did they enjoy it? It was pretty good atmosphere. You know, I'm assuming they had probably had a pretty good time tailgating. So um, if they're in the if they're in the deal for for enjoyment, um, then I would come back because I looked at the weather. It's going to be nice again. It's a night game, um, and so and we need them to provide a home field advantage. We need them. I get they're frustrated. We didn't win. You know, we played a tough schedule. You know, everybody that's beat us hasn't lost, right? Um, but that's no excuse. That's just the truth. And the games in our league are going to come down to the fourth quarter. And I don't think this one on Saturday is going to be any different. So um, we need them to help us. I do get their frustration. Um, but I don't think it's when you watch our product, I don't think the product is something that, that they should be other than the outcome. Like our kids play hard. That was a really physical football game on Saturday. Um, there's a lot of West Virginia kids out there spilling it out. Um, and so there was clear strength, clear physicality. Um, it was an entertaining football game. If you're a football fan, you're just watching that. It's pretty entertaining. We just didn't play well enough to win. And so I hope with that in mind, they would come back for another for another entertaining game that, that hopefully we can play better at the end and win. All right. So uh, there they are, the comments from Neil Brown. I mean, got to talk about him here, man. It's the elephant in the room right now throughout Mountaineer Nation. But, you know, Brad, I went over some of the numbers there earlier against ranked teams. West Virginia losing to the ranked team, twenty-eight to sixteen. But Brad, did you have a good time? Because I didn't. Because I didn't, man. I went to the game, and I wouldn't say it was a good time, man. Because you know, Neil Brown says you know, may, hopefully you had fun tailgating, you know, this and that, all the other stuff you mentioned in there, which is all well and good. And I hope people that did do. But some of us go up there just for the football game itself, and West Virginia's result, whether win or loss, is what really impacts our feelings not only for the rest of the day, but sometimes for the rest of the week or sometime thereafter. And, you know, when you live multiple hours away, like most of us do, is West Virginia being a state that's spread wide apart. We're here at the bottom in Mercer County, and that's where I travel to the games from. You know, it's three-plus hour drive there, three-plus hour drive back, and I go up there just for the game, hoping to see West Virginia win. And that's what, you know, makes me have a good time. So that was kind of my initial reaction to the comments. I think that they rubbed a lot of people – you know, even a worse way than they rubbed me. I think that because he what I don't think he really had ill intent with the comments personally. I think that maybe that is being overblown a little bit, but there are things in there that if you latch on to them, they can make you feel some type of way because I think we all want to win. And I don't think Neil Brown's not saying that he doesn't want to win there in those comments, but I think some people are trying to make it seem that way. So maybe that is, that part of it's a little bit overblown. But at the same time, you know, I'm not as entertained if we're only scoring 16 points and not winning versus ranked teams. What's entertaining, in my opinion, is beating ranked teams and competing for conference championships. Yeah, and I would even say to that point something when I was listening to it that he brought up right there is how hard – West Virginia boys are out there straining, yeah. how hard these guys are out there working, how hard the effort they are putting in, and wouldn't it be really rewarding to win a big damn game? Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't absolutely. It be, wouldn't absolutely. it be absolutely rewarding for those kids to see their hard work pay off? Damn. Yeah. And, and that's that's what really upset me is I – and he looks at it and he says, you know, if you're in it for enjoyment – what else are we in this for? I mean, I'm not in this to coach 19 to 22 year olds um, college football and get them to graduate. That might be what you're in it for and what you're getting paid for. You know what I mean? And it, that that's fine. If that's all that's expected from you, you can go do that anywhere. Yeah. You, you can you can you can go do that anywhere. But when when you come here, I'm saying like you said, you got people driving three hours, paying hundreds of dollars. That if you look at our state, they really don't have to go to a game because it's one of the few things that they get to look forward to every year. And then looking at them and being like, Hey, like what, what else can you ask for me? You know, like, Hey, is asking for a win in a big game too much? Is that, is that too big of an ask? Cause if the I, I feel like you see the ceiling at this point. And if like, you know, six, six is the ceiling and you're okay with that Neil Brown, then tell us now, because right now we're in a tough spot. Let us cut your contract in half. 
Yeah, because we're not okay with it. Take a half a pay cut. If that if that's what you're looking at us and saying, hey, you guys just got to be okay with this. <laughs> you guys just got to be okay with that. We're going to play hard football, and I appreciate it. And we're going to be in games, can appreciate it, but can't really come through and win them. And you know, it, it's going to be a, a shining moment and executing to absolute perfection to get there. I I, I feel like we'd have a better chance with somebody else. And so. If that's what you're telling me is, is that you've hit your ceiling and I can't expect any more than what I have from you this year, then that's sad. Yeah. Especially because this year you've regressed from where you were at last year. Quarterback's worse, line's worse, D's worse. Get yeah, tell you one area we've improved in. Well, and the bad thing is, yet again, you came out in the offseason and told us this was going to be your best team. This was your deepest team. This is your most talented team. This team looks like a team that compete for, can compete for the conference. And don't get me wrong, West Virginia is not out of the conference race yet. You know, lo and behold, uh, you do have a game against a ranked team this week, so obviously don't like the prospects of that going by what, with what we just said. But you are still, you know, mathematically in it. Um, we'll pull up the standings here in a bit. But, uh, you know, it's it's – the matter of, you know, six years, and not only are we not competing for a conference title, we're not winning the big games. We haven't won beaten a ranked team in two years, and with what is supposed to be your best team this year, we haven't been able to do it yet either. And, you know, we gave you – Your biggest critique, yeah, doubt. what people have said the most of. Yeah, we gave they you the benefit of the doubt after Penn State, get another home game against a ranked team, another national televised game, because after the Penn State game, he said the next time this team gets this opportunity, they'll be ready for it, and came out and – we weren't ready for it. I mean, we started off good, so maybe we were could say we were technically quote unquote ready for it. But I think throughout the game, what happened is the uh, the adjustments were made by Iowa State, and we got out coached. And that one, Neil Brown, uh, you know, I say it. I like the guy. Been a climb trustee well, since way back in 2019. There's been moments here and there where I've been on and again and off again. I'm not saying I'm out completely. I'm not saying this is a fire Neil Brown rant or anything like that. But I'm just saying that we as a fan base expect more. Uh, especially, especially when it comes to these big games. And after losing one of these big games, and uh, to come out and say that is a statement as a met when someone asks you for a message to fans, just was a little bit tone deaf, I think, by Neil Brown. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and especially for a man that claims to be so in touch with the fan base, you know, Western Apple, um, coming from, you know, Western Appalachia or whatever you want to call it out in Kentucky and, uh, you know, claims to really be connected to the state. And I think he does. I think this is where he wants to be, and this is the whole oh, – Sorry, y'all. Maisie saying hello. Hello, Maisie. <laughs> hey, you got the cat making an appearance. She's being real, real needy today. Um, I mean, you guys can see I'm back home. Uh, if you've been paying attention, I say I've been at a hotel the last few times, so uh, the animals have been missing me. Um, but yeah, when that's been Neil Brown's biggest like critique is like you know he's not been able to win the big games, and it comes out like at what point do we get to where fans aren't showing up to the game anymore, and you're just okay with that, <laughs> you know? Are you going to think people are still having fun when we're down to 30,000 people? Yeah, because it's not far from that right now at this point, judging by everything you've seen on social media. I'm going to be anxious to see what the numbers are for attendance on Saturday. I, you know, I've got season ticket holder, but I'm not going to be able to go this Saturday, unfortunately, because I have to work early in the morning um, on Sunday. But um, because of that, I'm going to be doing a stream here on the channel. That's kind of become our thing throughout the season is doing the game day watch-alongs where we all watch the game and talk with you guys in the chat as we do it. So, you know, Brad did that for the Iowa State game. I'm going to do that this weekend. But I do hope that people that do have season tickets and stuff do go and try and support the team for another night game, give them a good atmosphere because it is another, you know, big game. So he does have an opportunity right here to hopefully, you know, right the ship and give himself, you know, the benefit of the doubt because – a lot of the fans that were on the fence, those comments, I think, may have pushed them the wrong way uh, there as West Virginia lost a big game. I did want to make another comment about something else that happened in that uh, press conference that has not been getting talked about. Um, Neil Brown talking about, hey, he, he's lucky enough to be in a bubble, but that you know family members of coaches and players are not lucky enough. A lot of them didn't sign up for it. And, you know, He specifically yeah. brought up his daughter, and I don't know if that's a specific instance. I can't help but feel it's probably likely, you know, that his family's gotten some of this stuff. And to that point, like, I just want to talk to Mountaineer Nation, and I'm just a little fan. I don't mean nothing to nobody. But just coming from a human man, like, West Virginia is so much better than that. Yeah, this is a football game. Like, this is a guy coaching college kids through football 
that are common to a whole entire different university. And I know we spend hundreds of <laughs> hundreds of dollars personally. You know what I mean? The thousands of dollars. We've invested a lot into that. going to school there. We watch it every Saturday and we've invested a ton into it. But to that point, we will never invest as much as some of these kids have to what some of these coaches have. Like these people have thrown their whole life at this. And, you know, they might, he may not be a good football coach. He may not be a national championship winning football coach, but he's not a bad man. That guy didn't come here with the intention to destroy West Virginia and to ruin our lives and to make sure that we had a bad time. That's not what he's here for. And when you make it that personal, you're just being immature and childish. You think that you're something special. You think that you're the main character and everybody should just worry about what your issue is. And I think that's absolutely wrong. Us as West Virginians mean so much more than that. Community, family, what we've preached about, what makes our program special is what we identify as. And when you turn around and you do that to somebody that whether you like them or not has given so much to this place and really tried to make it work, it's disgusting. Be better than that. We're better than that. Mountaineers are way better than that. Well said. Absolutely agree with that 100% too, man. It's one thing to be, you know, critical of the coaching staff, critical of, you know, indecisions, stuff that were in regards to the game of football and to, you know, want to discuss that. But when it gets to a personal level and personal attacks and stuff, that's not cool, man. Yeah, like some dude on Twitter on one of these on one of these freaking burner accounts was like, you know, somebody needs to confront him in person because like these soft ass questions from the coach, like from the media just isn't doing it. No. You're disgusting, dude. Again, like you're just absolutely gross. And it's really funny of you to do that behind a burner account where you can't even impose any kind of responsibility for that. I think half those burners accounts are toxic. They should be gotten rid of. Mountaineer Nation shouldn't follow them. They're there for rage baiting media clicks and you know you're just egging it on and encouraging a culture that's absolutely disgusting so and also to me it's not cool to you know not support the team just because you want the coach to be fired and essentially root for us to lose that's not cool either man i don't i don't support that either man i think we should always cheer for wvu want them to win no matter what even if you dislike the way that a coach has done things dislike the coach's tenure you know you always want to see wvu come out on the winning side one way or the other so you know, to me, we can come on here, we can be critical, we can discuss coaching decisions, we can feel like maybe, you know, it's time to go another way. Some people I know do feel that way. We always try and kind of provide, you know, a little bit of both viewpoints here um, on the channel while trying to keep it as optimistic as possible. But we're one thing's for sure, we're always going to remain behind WVU and be, you know, cheering them on every game. And, of course, you can come see that in our watch-along streams that we've been doing. Uh, we're always going to root for WVU to win no matter what and how down we're feeling, as I'm sure we're all kind of feeling down after – um, taking this loss, which you know hurt us in the Big 12, which transitions us here, Brad. Let's talk a little bit about the Big 12 scores uh, from this past week and then take a look at the Big 12 standings before we shift gears and take a look at the upcoming week. We're going to talk about our Kansas State preview. But uh, this past week in the Big 12, on Friday night, we had the Arizona State pull off the win over Utah, 27-19. to Utah, two losses in conference. We like to see that, obviously. Uh, then on Saturday, we were just haters. I think we just know what's up. I was about to say, we told you, we told you, we told you here on the CRW podcast that Utah was not going to come in and dominate win this conference like their fans were trying to say they would. Yeah, and, but, you know, Cam Rising's got his doctorates coming. In oh, yeah. So he, might, he may do another medical redshirt, be back for an eighth year. He is. Cam Rising is. They, you know, they uh, – That's crazy. Guaranteed it. They said it went through. He's going to get his eighth year. Isn't that insane? That's, that's wild. Well <laughs> – We'll see if he has uh, success and can stay healthy in his eighth season there. A lot of people go to college for seven years. Mm -hmm. They're called doctors. <laughs> so he's, getting, he's getting a doctorate <laughs> in college football. Yeah, getting that doctorate. Saturday, October 12th, uh, from the Saturday slate, um, of course, we talked about the Mountaineers falling to Iowa State 28-16. to Iowa State moves into the top ten, now moves to 6-0. and uh, Then we also had Cincinnati taking down UCF, who's – just kind of reeling right now, 19 to 13 loss there. BYU remains undefeated as well on the season. They're continuing their hot run. No, Steven's not here for this episode out on assignment, but uh, when he comes back, I'm sure he's going to be excited to talk about BYU and their hot start because he predicted that more than anyone as they take down Arizona 41 to 19. And then the other game, which was our game of the week in the conference, it ended up being kind of the game of the week in the Big 12 with the way it played out. Kansas State and Colorado. Kansas State wins it 31-28, to and West Virginia's opponent comes into this game ranked in the top 20 and 5-1 and one overall, 2-1 and one in the Big 12. Uh, but those were the results from this past week. Brad, any thoughts there um, as I'll pull up the conference standings as you uh, provide any thoughts there on the Big 12? Oh, man, I thought USC really had a chance down there this weekend. I thought they were going to kind of get their act together. But, hey, Cincinnati, 
shocker surpriser this year in the Big Twelve so far, shimmying up them standings. Yeah. That's a good that's a good point there as well. Cincinnati, probably the one of the surprise teams of the league. I thought they would be better than people were giving them credit for, but I didn't know that they would start off this hot. You know, same goes for BYU there and Texas Tech bouncing back from that early season struggles that they had. As we take a look at the standings here, BYU and Iowa State atop the Big 12 standings, both at 3-0 and in conference, 6-0 and overall. Texas Tech also 3-0 and in conference. They're 5-1. and And then West Virginia is here among five different teams that are tied technically at fourth in the conference right now with a 2-1 and overall record. One of those being West Virginia's upcoming opponent, Kansas State, who's 5-1 and on the season, along with Arizona State, who is 5-1 and on the season. Colorado four and two on the season, and Cincinnati being the other one, as you mentioned, Brad, they're four and two on the season. So that's the top half of the Big Twelve Conference. Then in the bottom half here, we have Utah at ninth, TCU at tenth, UCF at eleventh, Arizona at twelfth, and Houston at thirteenth, all with one and two conference records. And your winless uh, Big Twelve Conference teams are Oklahoma State, Kansas, and Baylor there at the bottom of the Big Twelve standings. So. Um, any thoughts there on the Big 12 standings uh, before we transition, talk about West Virginia, Kansas State, and then get into our Big 12 preview to uh, round out this episode and make our picks for week eight in the conference, Brad? Yeah, look at a very few opportunities for West Virginia to prove something here. Yeah. What it's, looking like. it's true, man. Uh, that's, you know, I guess if you want to throw the golden blue glasses on, maybe that's one thing that you can do if West Virginia, you know, somehow finds a way to win this game against Kansas State. The rest of their schedule isn't as hard as this, you know, first little five game, five or six game skid was to begin conference play. The back half there has a couple tough games, but for the most part, it should be more toss up games for you. You know, even if you lose this game to Kansas State, you could go on a win streak at some point. I think West Virginia should still be a bowl team, if nothing else. You know, as I look at their upcoming schedule there and I look how, you know, competitive this conference has been from top to bottom really thus far how wide open it still is so you know if you want to be optimistic there's still that to look at for sure I just think that you know the way the things have played out in big games and the way the things have played out against ranked teams don't give you a lot of hope for this upcoming game against Kansas State which we can transition into talking about a little bit now man our Kansas State preview here and we'll get to our predictions to wrap up this preview but uh just an overall view of this game Kansas State Number 17 in the country there, so another opportunity for Neil Brown in this program to face a ranked team, and they get them in Morgantown for a night game. Coming up here on the 19th, Saturday night, 7.30 p.m. on Fox, yet again for the second straight week. Head coach at Kansas State, still Chris Kleiman. Um, Opening thoughts heading into this game, Brad, and then we'll touch a little bit on the matchups. I couldn't tell you anything. I don't know. I Am, am I going to get a team that's going to snap the football to me? Am I going to get a team that's actually going to look great? Um, you know, are we going to do 20 penalties, zero penalties? Uh, if I can know that ahead of time, I have a lot better chance talking about what this game's going to look like. Yes. <laughs> Which West Virginia team is going to show up? That's, that's mm-hmm. one of the main questions you got to lead it off with really, uh, with how this team has been so up and down this season. And it's an interesting matchup here. Two teams that are really in a way, when I look at them on the surface, kind of built similarly, uh, both offensively and defensively at times. So I think that presents an interesting matchup. And you hope that if it is even in that aspect, uh, maybe Kansas State has shown a little bit more talent on the season thus far in some areas that maybe the home atmosphere can be a little bit of a difference maker for you to still hope this can be a close game and can be a winnable game. I think it is a winnable game for West Virginia, but also, you know, the history that has been shown versus ranked team, as, as I said before, doesn't provide a lot of hope with that. But, you know, sometimes when you expect West Virginia to be, you know, down and out, that's when they show up and really, you know, do something special and unexpected. So maybe that's something that we can hope for in this game. But let's talk a little bit more about the matchups here. Let's start with the Kansas State offense versus the West Virginia defense, because uh, this is a Kansas State group that's done a great job moving the football on the ground this season uh, under new offensive coordinator Matt Wells, uh, who, of course, was a former head coach at Texas Tech and Utah State before then. Uh, they have the number two rushing offense in the conference, averaging 241 rushing yards per game, but they have the Big 12's leading rusher at the in the backfield there uh, with DJ Giddens, who currently leads the conference with 786 rushing yards. And, of course, he's not their only weapon to run the football with. With the quarterback Avery Johnson can really hurt you in the run game. He leads the team with three rushing touchdowns. He's tied for that lead with the other running back, 
Dylan Edwards. Johnson has ran for 306 yards on the season, and Edwards has ran for 222. Uh, they do have a good receiver, though, within the Big 12 there in Jace Brown, who's been their leading receiver on the season. He has 398 yards, and he's averaging 17 yards per catch. Had the game winner there against Colorado. Johnson has thrown 11 passing touchdowns versus five interceptions, 62% completion rating on the season. Um, and they also have, you know, the best run grade, according to PFF there as team run, rushing offense is concerned there with an 88.5. So should be an interesting matchup, I think, because West Virginia's strength for a lot of the season has been, you know, rushing defense going up against what has, you know, by, all, by and large been probably the best rushing offense in the Big 12 with perhaps the best running back in the conference in DJ Giddens and, of course, Avery Johnson, probably the best rushing quarterback the Mountaineers have faced yet. So interested to see how that matchup plays out as West Virginia's passing defense has kind of been their struggle, but passing offense hasn't necessarily been Oklahoma – I mean, not Oklahoma State, excuse me, Kansas State's uh, main forte either, though. So interesting matchup, kind of strength on strength, weakness on weakness when you're talking about this Kansas State offense versus the West Virginia defense. But what are your thoughts on how this matchup matchup could play out and how it may play out on Saturday night in Morgantown, Brad. Yeah, I think St. Kansas State's got a really solid, consistent offense. Um, and they establish themselves with a run game through real clean play, and then they're able to beat you with uh, uh, scramble plays and passes over the top. It just kind of like can work out that way. When it comes down to our defense, I mean, honestly, last game they played, I thought, really well. They played enough to keep us in the game. They really embrace that bend, don't break mentality, and I thought that they – you know, put together a pretty, pretty decent game. I think when it comes down to it, it's just going to be big plays. That seems to be what it is. Um, when we make a mistake, are we able to stop them? You know, because that's really what killed us against, um, against uh, Iowa State. Absolutely. You know, it's just like the big blown assignments. That's what it was. The defense otherwise played great. So when it comes down to it, man, that's what's got to be cleaned up. You can't have those big mistakes because if you can – get down there and keep doing what you've been doing, then we've got a chance. Because I don't expect the offense to come back in and have the same issues that I had last weekend with snapping. If it does, then I guess fire everybody. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, fire me from being a fan because that's just so unbelievable. Um, yeah, I, I don't expect us to have the, those, those same issues. So, like you said, we could come out this weekend and absolutely crush it because we had that potential. You're, you're looking after the Oklahoma State game. Walking into Iowa State, we had all the confidence in the world that we were going to come out and look like the exact same team the week beforehand, and all of a sudden we get the yips on snaps and we don't look the same. So if that comes out and gets fixed this weekend, there's no reason we can't absolutely contend. And I think a lot of that's going to come from the defense continuing to progress and embrace that bend don't break mentality. And I think that they can even hold up against that against Kansas State because they've shown that they can do it, you know, against some pretty good talent. Yeah. That's true, and that's one thing we probably should have mentioned more when we were talking a little bit about the Iowa State game here at the top of the show is really, all in all, that loss wasn't on the defense. I thought that they performed pretty well. The only time that they, you know, save for the one big play that we mentioned where they had the breakdown in coverage, other than that, they played Iowa State really well. Um, you know, they gave up the points off the turnovers when they had to, you know, defend a short field, which hurt. But I think that was, you know, not a bad performance by the defense. I think since the bye week, the defense has looked better. So, you know, that hopefully – continues to hold true with this you know tough matchup against Kansas State. Uh, a little bit more different style than Iowa State. I don't think they're as good of a passing team, but they can move the football. DJ Ginzer at the running back position does worry me, but I hope that West Virginia's defense continues to play you know as strong as they've looked and more like the team we've seen after the bye week than what we saw earlier in the season. But uh, you know, one thing that does concern me is the de defensive line injuries. If they're continuing to stack up, TJ Jackson went down, of course, late mm -hmm. in that last game. His status is questionable for this game. You still don't have Eddie V, so you don't want that to pile up too much, especially in this game where Kansas State's a good running team. So that's, you know, the one area of concern for me in this matchup. But overall, I think West Virginia's rushing de uh, defense has been good this season. So I think that it's an interesting matchup to see how it plays out, and hopefully the rushing defense shows up on Saturday because West Virginia will need it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, again, that's where you're getting some more settling down in the linebackers and, you know, um, other than a little bit of turnover up front, you know, you're, you're starting to get more into that. So, yeah, like I said, defense is looking better. So if offense can get their things together, then you got a chance because they were not even put in good positions with the two turnovers um, last weekend, too. So they were playing with their backs against the wall a little right. bit. Exactly, exactly. So overall, not a bad game by the defense. We do deserve mentioning that against Iowa State. So hopefully 
they uh, can carry that performance over, you know, back to back good performances now really from the defense, uh, you know, performances that'll get you, you know, wins if the West Virginia offense plays up to its capability, which mm-hmm. they did not in this previous game. But we're hoping they play more like it in this game against Kansas State. So let's talk a little bit about that now. The WVU offense versus this Kansas State defense. K State defense, uh, the coordinator there, Joe Klanderman, in the sixth year at Kansas State. Another three down defensive line in front there, somewhat similar to the Iowa State defensive scheme. They are the number one rushing defense in the Big 12. So another, you know, matchup, kind of like what we talked about on the other side. Uh, this time it's strength versus strength on this side as well. Uh, West Virginia have been a good rushing offense for the most of the season, but Kansas State's been the number one rushing defense in the Big 12, only allowing 72 rushing yards per game. They also have the Big 12's leader in sacks on the D-line in Brendan Mott. Uh, then at the next level you have Austin Romaine, who has 39 tackles on the season. He's their team leader in that category. And their secondary, though it's not been as highly rated as their rushing defense has, and they are battling some injuries at secondary coming into this game, uh, they have been a little bit opportunistic there. Five interceptions on the season, three players that have one each, and their safety, K.J. Payne, has two of his own. Uh, So this defense, I think, has been pretty tough on the season. You know, top rushing defense in the Big 12 to go along with what we talked about earlier, perhaps the top rushing offense in the Big 12 that they have there at Kansas State. So uh, similarly built to West Virginia, as I mentioned earlier, as West Virginia tries to be good in both those areas as well and have been throughout this season. West Virginia's rushing offense got off to a hot start against Iowa State. Then, you know, maybe playing from behind after a period, didn't get to utilize it as much. But I think in this game, you're going to have to hope that your rushing offense shows up if you're taking on this Big 12 number one rushing defense at Kansas State because you're still going to have to rely on that rushing offense. You can't be a team that, you know, drops back and throws the ball 30 or 40 times. Like that was part of the problem against Iowa State. So interesting to see if West Virginia's offense can step up to the plate and what looks like a tough matchup with this Kansas State defense. But what are your thoughts on it, Brad? Um, is Hudson Clement one of the most consistent receivers we've seen under Neil Brown? <laughs> I mean, honestly, to this point in the season, I think he has been, you know. One of Neil Brown's best wide receivers we've had, maybe. No, I think I think so. I mean, he's up there in that conversation. Yeah, which I mean, it's not like you have a lot to choose from, but it's just fun to think about. I mean, Hudson Clement just again showed that he has all the talent in the world to go out there and play against anybody. And those were some good DBs. And I think that he got locked down the second half. I think they started focusing on him a little bit more, and I think that opened up T. Ray. You saw T. Ray get a lot more involved yeah, after that point. And so I think that that was because Hudson Clement came out there and said, "Hey." You guys got to focus on me or I'm going to keep doing this all night. And so that that was good. Good to see. Um, man, I don't know what to say. I This offense can look great, but I'm so concerned. I'm so concerned about this weekend with it just like not coming out with the hot start. And it feels like that just had to be the mantra all year long for this team is they have to get rolling or they just don't have it. Because I really think that those snaps hindered them last week. And I think that they can be a great offense in spite of that. I think that the frustration just got to them and it threw everything off. But still, Garrett Green continues to make bad decisions with the football and turnovers are going to kill you. we have seen Iowa State shows they can be, you know, like you said, opportunistic. They've got big turnovers on the season that killed us against Iowa State and they can do it again. Um, and so if the offense comes out and they start the, the falter, I, I could see things going very, very wrong really quickly. So, um, for me, they just got to get rolling. I mean, we, we can get the run game going. I think that our offense can compete with anybody in the Big 12. I've said that before. Um, even our run game. Iowa State's got a great run defense. I think we can still run it on them. It just all comes down to executing. And that's going to be so incredibly important on Saturday. Yeah, 100% agree with you, man. Execution's got to be the key. Uh, that's what they did such a good job of in 2023 was – uh, you know, not do, making those little mistakes that get you beat. Uh, you know, last year, I think I noted a lot of times that they had like five pen- penalties or less. It was usually a good game for them. Low penalties, dominating time of possession, and not, you know, turning the ball over a ton were the strengths last year. And at times, at least one of those three areas have been a weakness in games. You look at Garrett Green, he's already thrown more interceptions this year than he did all of last year. So it's just something you got to try and get corrected, play a little bit cleaner, I think, especially in a game like this where it may be a tough matchup for you. You may have to throw the football a little bit. I'd like to see us get the run game going against the Big 12's number one rushing defense and come out and make a statement that we do still have a good rushing offense. But if not, you're going to have to hope that Garrett Green is better 
decision making is better in this game than it was against Iowa State and has been for most of this season. But I do like what you mentioned there about, you know, getting rolling with the fast start. Something West Virginia has tried to do, and I think that's kind of their formula under Neil Brown that has led them to success. That's one why you look at he has such a good record when West Virginia runs the football well, is because if they can get off to a fast start, get an early lead, get up a couple possessions in a game in the first half then they can start to, you know, use that running game, work that clock. And Neil Brown also has a really positive le- record when West Virginia has a halftime lead. So, you know, that's one thing to look at with this game is hopefully West Virginia can have a good first half, get the home crowd into it and let them stay in it. Unlike that game against Iowa State, as we mentioned earlier, when kind of all the air went out of the stadium after you gave up the lead uh, with a chance to make it 10-0 and potentially even 14-0 if you make that catch on third down before the missed field goal. Uh, mm-hmm. But I think that's going to be a major key in this one is getting that early lead and that fast start can be – Critical and something they've tried to create. Last game they received, you know, the opening kickoff, and that's the 13th consecutive game West Virginia's received the start of the game. Yeah, crazy. And they're trying, you know, they think it's because it's results in more. I think that's really good. Yeah, I'm saying it's it's against the norm too, which I think is real fun. Yeah. It's smart, especially if it, it can be effective, which we thought it was going to be last week, and it started that way. So, you know, look for West Virginia to try and get the ball first again in this game and hopefully try and take control of it. And if they do take control of it, do a better job keeping control of it. So I think a fast start will be a key for the West Virginia offense. But let's talk about those major keys. Uh, with its time, for our keys to victory, Brad, and then we will talk our score prediction, of course, for West Virginia and Kansas State. Game seven of the season for West Virginia, week eight of the college football season here, week eight uh, as far as, you know, for the rest of the Big 12 is concerned as well. And we'll make our picks of those games here after we talk keys to victory and score predictions for K-State. But key to victory, Brad, we'll talk a little bit about this first. For me, I teased it a little bit earlier. I'll leave this one off. I think the major key for West Virginia to try and find a way to get one of these major wins, get a signature win for Neil Brown that he so desperately needs, get a ranked win that this program so desperately needs and is starving for, it is win the rushing battle in this game. You have to have good rushing defense and you have to have good rushing offense in this game to win. West Virginia is number one in the Big 12 in run grade defense on according to PFF there with the 89.7 grade. So, In that aspect, you have the Big 12's number one rush defense versus the Big 12's number one rushing offense. And then if we mentioned Kansas State's rushing defense versus West Virginia's rushing offense. So winning those two battles is a major key in this football game. It's going to take some good tackling and a way to, you know, force some missed tackles as well because both these teams have good run defenses because they're good at tackling. Number two in the Big 12 in tackling, according to PFF, Kansas State with a 79.3 grade. And you know who number one in the Big 12 in tackling is? WVU, 81.2 grade there, according to PFF. So both these teams, good at tackling. So for West Virginia rushing offense, force some missed tackles. For the West Virginia rushing defense, don't allow them to uh, do that to you. And you might wrap up, make good tackles. West Virginia needs to win the rushing battle on offense and defense. That's my key to victory in this one, Brad. What about you? What's your key to the West Virginia finding a way to have a big victory that this program really could use right now? Yeah, I'm going to go to the turnover margin. I think in games like this against big opponents, you can't turn the ball over. And I think that we're second to last right now in the Big 12 in turnover margin, negative five or some ridiculous number. We we are not doing great in the turnover margin right now. We've got to get that cleaned up. If we ever want to compete in these games with the brand of football that we play, we can't just get possessions away. And, and it comes back to kills. How, like I said at the top of the show, how many times have we talked about giving 14-point swings, 10-point swings, um, because of turnovers. And that's been consistent. One thing throughout the Neil Brown era, uh, you know, last year they did, you know, a pretty good job of taking care of the football overall on offense, but they didn't force hardly any turnovers on defense. So really you look consistently throughout the Neil Brown era to one thing that you can point to as a consistent negative point. It's West Virginia's turnover margin. They haven't mm-hmm. done a good job forcing turnovers and they've you know committed way too many this year as well. So that's a bad combination if you're not doing either one of those. So winning this turnover battle would be a big key. Um, especially if it allows you to win the time of possession, which I think is huge in this football game. So having said that, we've talked a little bit about the matchup, talked about the keys. Now let's get into it, Brad. It's that time to get down to the nitty-gritty portion of these preview and predictions episodes. And here it is in episode 202 here in season seven, our Kansas State preview and predictions edition of our score predictions for the upcoming game for West Virginia as they welcome in the number 17 team in the country for a 7.30 p.m. night game televised there. On Fox, Neil Brown, we mentioned the stat earlier. We don't need to go over it again. Haven't won a ranked game since 2021. 
Brad, he's got another team coming in ranked, a chance to do it, and also a chance to, you know, stay within the top half of the Big 12 standings as we showed those earlier and maybe position yourself in the Big 12 race still yet. I know things seem bleak right now, but that hope is still there if West Virginia can pull this off. Having said that, Brad, can they pull it off and uh, finally defeat a ranked team for the first time in a long time? What's your score prediction for Saturday night against the Wildcats? Um, 28-20. I think West Virginia gets it done. I think Neil Brown gets to look people wow. in the face and say, I told you so. Okay. Yeah, okay. I just don't think that we're going to have the same issues we had last weekend. And I think that it's so easy to get caught up on the frustration of not winning the cold game. Um, and – Quite honestly, I just – I I think I think it's a must win. I think he's oh, kind of at that point. I think I think Neil Brown needs to flip that switch and something needs to change. I think I think he needs to go animal mode. He needs to absolutely look at the whole entire fan base, look at everybody else and say, fuck you, pardon my French, but that's where you got to be, Neil. You, you, you got to stop worrying about – and they say you're in your little bubble and – X, Y, and Z, brother. You you need to you need to flip that switch and do it. Uh, it's got to be done. This weekend's a must win. Um, I, I think if you come out and you don't win, I think you're going to have a hard time holding on to your job through the end of the season unless money keeps us there. Yeah. I, I just – I really do. I think that that's your season right there. We talked about it. You've got no chance really to make a statement after this, even if you beat up on a bunch of bad teams. You're never going to be able to point to anything and say you've done anything. Well said. And, you know, great way to put it because I think that that is probably true. Season definitely on the line here, probably with your Big 12, you know, championship hopes, of course, definitely on the line in this game, I'd say. So you can definitely maybe say season on the line. And if this season's on the line, could that potentially be Neil Brown's job on the line here in a must-win game? I don't know that about that latter half for sure, but I'd say this definitely could be your season right here. It's definitely a make-or-break game. But I do like your prediction there because, you know, one thing you can say about Neil Brown is when his back's been against the wall and we've counted him out, that's when he finally comes out and gets a win that we aren't expecting him to pick up. So I don't think that you're too far-fetched in your prediction. And I think he's going to hear all this, and I think he's going to want it worse than anything. I, I don't think there's going to be any game that no Brown has wanted to win worse than the game that's coming up this Saturday. It's a good point, man, and probably true, I'd say. So uh, Brad with a optimistic prediction there, giving WVU the win over Kansas State. Yeah, I'll say, will he actually deserve the right to look at us and shake his finger? I don't think so. <laughs> you know, it's still you're still way in the loss category when it comes to beating top yeah. 25 teams, but – I It'd think be he's big for this year, though. It would be yeah. big for him. Yeah, I think he's going to have a chance to say it after this one. Would be an opportunity for him to do so. And I hope he does get afforded that opportunity, and I hope that you're right there, man. As far as I'm concerned, I do think that this is a game West Virginia can win. I think I've talked about that you know, throughout this episode. If they show up and play the way that they did early in that Iowa State game and eliminate the mistakes, then they're definitely going to have a decent chance, I think. Um, I do like the fact that Kansas State, despite the fact that you know DJ Gooden scares me and you know, Avery Johnson can be dangerous, I trust West Virginia's rushing defense if the injuries on the defensive line don't end up hurting, especially you know if TJ Jackson ends up not playing this game, which is questionable right now, and Aubrey Burks end up playing not playing in this game, which is also questionable. Definitely makes me a little bit less optimistic, uh, but I think that even with that, um, thinking that West Virginia has you know a decent decent to better chance than they did against Iowa State even uh, because we talked about, you know, Neil Brown's back being against the wall and the matchups there. I think that I can't let, you know, my heart get in front of my head on this one. I got to try and take my golden blue glasses off with this one and, you know, look at it through a different lens, which the lens I'm looking at it through is I really can't predict you to win this football game with the things that I presented earlier that are currently facts for this program and for the Neil Brown era. You haven't beaten a ranked team since 2021. You know, every big game we've had at home at night, we haven't played well in, uh, you know, 3-16 and 16 versus ranked teams currently. So until you prove to me that you can do it um, when, you know, we really need it against a big team in a ranked game, um, I don't think I can pick, predict you to win. So the injuries on defense is the question mark and just that fact there. I think I'm going to have to give Kansas State the slight edge in this one. I think they come out on top 34 to 28. West Virginia keeps it close, but then they have a loss that could mean and be detrimental for this season. And uh, then we're going to see what happens in a bad way throughout this fan base if West Virginia doesn't find a way to win. So, all in all, you know, I give my prediction there as a loss, but uh, I want to wrap it up by saying that I hope that you're right, Brad, because this fan base could really use some positivity right now uh, moving forward on this season. And that would be a big, 
uh, ray of light they need after everything that's happened in this past you know few days. Yeah, for sure. Like I said, I, I do, I do think that we were quick to get over the Oklahoma State game because Oklahoma State was really bad, but we looked good in that game, and we got a chance to look like that again. If we play like that, we can beat any team. Just like last, like I said, to me last weekend, it was snaps really got to me. I think that that killed your offense, and your defense played good enough to win. If your offense would have done the same, it would have been an easy win of a ball game. Yeah. And that was against a good team. And I think that we're playing against a good team this weekend. I think we have just the same chance. Uh, hopefully, you know, that's an issue that they have cleaned up. They've had all week to fix it now. Hopefully Yates has gotten it, you know, under control. Maybe his hands feel a little bit better. Or maybe, you know, they do do what we're talking about, playing McGuire to play Landon Livingston. Whatever they have to do, I'm sure that they'll have it corrected and won't have that same issue. Just got to hope no other, no other issues rear their head and West Virginia just does a better job. With the little small things, you know, the mental mistakes, if they clean those up, I think it's going to be a close football game and a good football game like a lot have been throughout the Big 12, which brings us to our final segment here on episode 202 where we take a look around the Big 12 here for week eight now in the conference. The year flying by already up to week eight in the Big 12 conference, Brad. Time to make our picks for the slate in week eight, and it starts on Friday night. Oklahoma State heads into Provo to take on BYU with the late kick there, 10-15 Eastern time on Friday night. BYU, one of the maybe biggest surprises in the conference um, as we talk about surprises in the Big 12. Undefeated on the season overall and undefeated in conference. Oklahoma State coming into town. I'll take my pick f- prediction here first, Brad, and I'm going to go Oklahoma State. I think that Mike Gundy, we saw them you know, in the past, especially when you think all hope is lost and especially coming off of bye weeks is sometimes when they get things corrected. I think that they're going to come out after this bye week and play a lot better. I don't know if they'll necessarily win the game, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say that they do it and get it done there on the road. Oklahoma State shocks everybody and looks like a team, uh, you know, back from the grave there, gets a win over what has been, you know, the top team in the conference or one of the top teams in the conference against BYU. But what are your thoughts on this matchup Friday night? Don't tell Steven. I predicted that, by the way. Yeah, I was just I was thinking for you, Steven. I got BYU. I think <laughs> I think the Oklahoma State's just not going to have that good of a year. I think Gundy will get one, but I don't think this is it. Yeah, I don't blame you. BYU is a tough place to play, and we'll just keep scrolling right on by that to the Saturday slate and hope that Steven doesn't see that if he tunes into the episode. Hope he misses that part. It's not paying attention or something because he'll be mad at me for not picking BYU there. But, hey, got to go out on a limb sometime in some of these games. And the Friday night games have been unpredictable this season. Exactly, and the best time to do it is when he's not here, 100%. Couldn't agree more with that. So that's what we got Friday night and then Saturday for the Saturday slate here in week eight. We got Arizona State at Cincinnati at noon there on ESPN+. Plus. Two surprise teams in the conference this year. So we yes, talked so about earlier. Cinderella yeah. story game? Yeah, both 2-1 and one in the conference. Both, I believe, 4-2 and two overall as well on the season. Cincinnati with the home field advantage. Arizona traveling pretty much cross-country there, Brad. Who do you like in this one? Um, I don't know. Like I said, this is a fun game. This is a Cinderella story game. It should be a fun one for everybody to watch. <laughs> you know, two teams that everybody thought would kind of be in the slums, up here competing. One of them is really going to differentiate themselves this weekend. So um, I'm going to go with the new old Big 12, the old new Big 12. The old new <laughs> Big 12, I think, is what we're going with here. Um, yeah, give me Cincinnati at home. Okay. Um, you know. Yeah. I don't just, blame just you. Just because they were in the Big 12 first. I don't blame you. They – uh They've looked a lot improved this season. Swarbsby looks like a good fit for them at quarterback in that offense. Corleone, that defensive line's pretty strong. And Corey Connor, I think, is an underrated running back. Uh, so Cincinnati does have a good team. But I think I'm going to go Arizona State, man. I think I'm going to ride that magic that the Sun Devils have shown so far this season. Uh, after they beat uh, Utah, their coach's postgame press conference. I love that, man. They got to be hyped when I was watching that, him just getting excited and getting lost into the crowd. You love that great energy from these young coaches and uh, made me a fan of Arizona State a little bit low-key. And uh, I like that running back, Scadaboo, there. We've talked about him in the past. Mm -hmm. He's on Steven's fantasy team in our college football fantasy league. And I like Arizona State's play style. So I think that the way that they play kind of travels as well. And even coming across to Cincinnati for the game, I think that Arizona State will find a way to get it done. I'm going to take the Sun Devils there in that noon contest which then brings us to one of the 330 contests on the day in the Big 12, and that is Houston traveling to Kansas. Uh, Both teams that have been a bit of a mixed bag this year, Kansas, like we mentioned, bottom of the conference. Houston not far off from that. They do have the one big win over TCU, but for the most part, you know, struggling in year one under Willie Fritz, but Kansas could really use a victory here, Brad. Who do you got in this 330 game? Yeah, Kansas needs a victory, and I think they're going to get it. 
I think that Houston is still kind of getting their their gyms together, and Kansas is desperately searching for a win. I think that they get it right at home. This is probably coming close to their homecoming game. So, um, yeah, give me Kansas at home with this one. You know what? We're going to be in agreement here on this one, Brad, because I 100% think – Kansas is overdue, man. Yeah, finally, right? But they are. Kansas is overdue. They've lost, what, three, four of their games, if not five. You know, multiple of their games have been lost in the fourth quarter in games where they've had leads, looked like they were going to win it and lose it in the last you know minute or two, including against us. They're going to find a way to do it at home, I think. I got Kansas beating Houston as well in that one, uh, which brings us to our next contest. Uh, we're going to skip over that other uh, one of these other games there. It'll be the game of the week. We'll talk about it momentarily. But before we get to there, we got to go through the rest of the slate here, starting at 4 o'clock on ESPN2. Baylor against Texas Tech. Texas Tech, as we mentioned, 3-0 and in the conference. Really bounced back from some early season struggles versus a coach, you know, that is certainly probably on the hot seat at this point in uh, Dave Aranda at Baylor. They head into Lubbock, Brad, for this 4 o'clock Eastern contest there on ESPN2. Who do you like between the Bears and the Red Raiders? Yeah, this is my upset pick of the week. I think Dave Aranda can actually kind of go into Lubbock here and get him one. I really do. I think that, you know, Dave Aranda's still got a little bit in him, but uh, I don't think it's going to save their season. But I, I think that he's going to be get them sneaky together for this one. I think that sometimes Lubbock cannot always be the toughest place to play. And uh, I don't know. I just, I just feel the stumble in me this weekend. Okay. It's Brad's upset pick, and I'm going to have to disagree with that one, Brad. I think that Texas Tech with Taj Brooks, you know, if DJ Giddens at Kansas State that we're playing this week isn't the best running back in the Big 12, it's probably Taj Brooks. I'd say it's one of the two. I think Taj Brooks will continue to have a good day. And, you know, if Baylor tries to sell out to stop the run, Texas Tech, of course, can throw the football as well. Having the home field advantage there also, I got them getting the win. So I got Texas Tech over Baylor. Then we have a couple night games to talk about here before we talk about our game of the week. And one of those night games, we have an undefeated team. The West Virginia just took the loss to Iowa State, going back home to play at 7.30 Eastern on Fox Sports 1. And welcome in UCF, who was looking like a stronger team in this conference about three weeks ago. And since then, the wheels have really fallen off. Three-game losing streak, if I'm not mistaken. And they've also had some players hit the portal. So, UCF kind of reeling and now has to head into Ames, a tough place to play against a top 10 team in the country. Um, I don't think there's any chance UCF pulls off the upset here on this one. Maybe, you know, it's close at times, but I think Iowa State really does look like a good football team to me. I think that's a really good football team that West Virginia lost to, but also looked like they could play with. So that's why I think you could look at either side of the coin there if you want to be optimistic or pessimistic about the Mountaineers. But I think the Cyclones have a chance to wind up playing for a Big 12 championship game at season's end, and I think they'll handle UCF there at 7.30 on Saturday night. Brad, what about you? Yeah, we're saying on that one. I think Iowa State keeps it going. Like I said, UCF's been struggling this year a lot more than I thought they would be going into it. So, yeah, Iowa State at home, I don't even think it's going to be close. Yeah, I very well could get that way. Iowa State at home, very tough there in Ames, and this looks like a very good team Matt Campbell has. Well, shout out to Matt Campbell. That guy's a heck of a football coach. Um, and then TCU in Utah as the nightcap in the Big 12. It'll be a 1030 Eastern kick on ESPN. TCU, a little bit up and down this season, kind of similar to WVU. They've had their moments, but then, of course, they've also lost games that they shouldn't have, as I mentioned, losing earlier in the season to Houston. But Utah as well, not having the season that they expected. You know, their fans thought they'd come in and dominate the conference. We said that they wouldn't come in and dominate the conference. And, you know, even if they do end up, you know, finishing higher ranked in the conference, if they pull things together, they certainly haven't came in and dominated right now already with two conference losses. But interesting matchup here. They will have the home field advantage for this 1030 kick there on ESPN, Brad. Who do you have between TCU and Utah? Yeah, I'm going TCU, man. I, I think that Utah Soldiers doesn't have the juice. Um, I think TCU is looking for a good win. They're hungry. They, you know, They've not had the exact season they wanted up to this point. And I think they're going to walk in there and catch Utah at the right time. I'm giving me TCU. Yeah. I think time and time again throughout this season, we pretty much, you know, I'd say like 90% of the time have shown that not picking Utah works out. And uh, we're going to do that again and execute that again here on the show. And it's going to manifest a win for TCU because I'm going to agree with Big you. Big please. Horned frogs. Exactly. That's right. That's right. Superstition fully in play here 
on the road, TCU gets the win on the late night kick, according to the CRW host. If it happened, you heard it here first. Mm-hmm. Uh, which brings us to. We do know these things. We write the scripts. That's right. That's right. We we assist with the script writing for the. Big I hate Mountaineer fans. They're my least favorite. <laughs> uh, if we wrote the scripts, we know that what would happen there for the Mountaineers. It'd be mm-hmm. going a lot different. That's for sure. But in the scripts that we have been right on. Um, we have been right on Utah, so hopefully we're right there again on that one. And TCU gets a win against uh, the newcomers there. But speaking of newcomers, in our game of the week, we have a couple of those facing off in Arizona. Game of the week here in week eight in the Big 12 is going to be the 4 o'clock Eastern kick on Fox featuring Colorado and Arizona. Both coming off of losses, but both you know have had their moments this season. I think Colorado certainly looks better than what I expected and better than what they did last season. Arizona at times has looked like a conference competitor and at times has not. Last week against BYU being the latter of those. So Colorado and Arizona, Brad, who do you have here this midday kick there at 4 o'clock on Fox in our game of the week for week eight in our Around the Big 12 segment? Yeah, whoever scores 75 first probably. Um. <laughs> it could be one of those. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, really, my logic here, I'm getting real in-depth with it and getting real scientific. So generally, when, this year, I felt like I've chosen Arizona a lot, and it's not worked out for me. So this time, I'm going to go Colorado Okay. in hopes that Arizona decides to win this time. Yeah, I think that, um, you know what, we're going to be in agreement on the game of the week because, you know, it's so like I told Steven, once I saw Colorado, you know, come out, and uh, beat Baylor and then went again the next week against UCF, who I thought was a good team at the time. You know, I've always been behind Colorado. I thought they were going to be a good football team. I've been some big supporter of their program. Uh, never doubted them for a second, man. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's the story I'll mm-hmm. tell when I'm sticking to it. It's not like there's video or audio proof of, of otherwise. But, no, mm-hmm. uh, par- partially because of what you said, maybe it'll uh, result in me being wrong and Arizona comes out and gets the win. I, I kind of would like to see Arizona win, especially a week before we have to play them. It's going to be back-to-back home games for the Wildcats. So if they're going to win one, I'd rather them win this one than the one next week against WVU. Uh, but even with that, I'm going to go Colorado. Um, you know, depending on if Travis Hunter is able to come back and play, they didn't have Travis Hunter and Jimmy Horn and still stuck with Kansas State, though, who I actually think is probably a better team than Arizona. So because of that reason, if they do have uh, you know either one of those players or both back, especially Travis Hunter, I think Colorado can get that win on the road. So we're going to be in agreement and both pick the Buffaloes in the game of the week, and that will wrap up our Around the Big 12 segment here on Week 8 and get us close to wrapping up Episode 202 here, our Kansas State preview and predictions Mm -hmm. as we've gone back, talked about Iowa State, talked a little about Neil Brown and some of his comments and some of the, you know, controversy going on throughout Mountaineer Nation in regards to those and kind of his job status moving forward following the struggles and big games, the games against ranked teams, and then, of course, shared our thoughts on one of those big games against a ranked team that West Virginia has coming up on Saturday against Kansas State and, of course, covered the conference there as well. But having said that, Brad, anything you want to touch on here before we get ready to wrap up uh, this episode here on Episode 202 of the CRW Podcast? Yeah, y'all, this weekend, even with a loss, we're not going to be parting from a coach mid-season anytime, anytime in the near future. It's not going to be happening. Um, And also with that in place, I need you guys to remember that it is going to cost a lot of money to bail Neil Brown out. Um, Him, his assistant coaches, buy a new coach. Um, On top of that, there's a looming $20 million settlement sitting on top of everybody's head. It's not going to happen after this game. It's a longer season. Stick in tight. Show up on Saturday and let's, let's watch some football. Yeah, absolutely. Like we said earlier, no matter what, always got to support the Mountaineers and hope that they win football games. Even if you don't like the direction that things are going, even if you don't like the current coach, we're here because we like WVU. You're watching this or listening to this because you're a WVU football fan. In essence, we only get at least at minimum 12 times a year to get to watch, you know, our favorite team play, get to watch the Mountaineer play. So why not support them and hope that they play well and you can get more enjoyment out of that because, you know, as Neil Brown said, it's all about the enjoyment and the, Things are a lot more fun when West Virginia is winning for sure there. So, you know, no matter what, I do agree with you. West Virginia is not going to make a coaching change midseason. And, you know, barring maybe not making a bowl game or a season that's worse than that, I don't know if they'll make one overall after this season as well because of the things you mentioned there, financial status is going on at the university as a whole. Plus, let's not forget, next year they have to start, you know, doing revenue sharing with the players. The university is going to have to shell out around $20 million to pay football players. Plus, you'd have to play the buyouts of this staff 
pay for the new coaching staff, assistant coaches, and the head coach. It'd be a lot of money right now, so I don't know if West Virginia is in a financial position to be able to do it even after the season without some big backers coming forward and giving them a lot of money. So, you know, may as well cheer for West Virginia and hope that things get turned around and West Virginia can right the ship. They have a big opportunity to do so in this game against Kansas State there. So I think well said, Brad, in a wide open Big 12 race. You at least got one more chance for West Virginia to stay in that race here on Saturday. So let's cheer them on in this upcoming game against Kansas State that we've previewed throughout this episode. And then lastly, I just want to mention to you guys, we appreciate you tuning in this episode. Whether you watched on YouTube, if you did tune in there, just before you head out, hit that little thumbs up button. Give us a like on the video. It helps a ton with the algorithm there. And if you're a Mountaineer football fan, be sure to subscribe to the channel here. We're always putting out WVU football content, a couple podcast episodes per week, live stream every week, and then Content for members only. If you join here as a channel member, you can get player grades, snap counts, depth chart projections, film reviews, game rewatches, and also on Saturdays we've been trying to uh, make it as much as possible throughout throughout the season to do game watch alongs where we watch the WVU football game together. So a ton of WVU football content here on the Country Roads webcast you can subscribe to. But we also appreciate you tuning in on the audio side. If you choose to do that, you can find it on any podcast platform, Spotify, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, you name it. And if you listen there, Leave us a rating, preferably a five-star one, if you would. Um, We'll be back to recap the Kansas State regardless of the results. We'll keep the Mountaineer football content coming forward, and we'll continue to support this team. As we know, you all will as well and hope that you do continue to do so, as we hope you continue to support us here on the CRW. For my co-host Brad, as always, I'm Jordan Cruz. Until next time, let's go. Mountaineer. If you really want to know, then come on, let's go. Take a stroll down those.